So I was cleaning up some areas of my house, rearranging, because I got that fridge coming in. I got to have a nice clear path. And I found this, which I also got from Lance for a great deal. It's obviously a ColecoVision. Now, the reason I wanted this was because many years ago, I did a ColecoVision portable, but I did a really poor job of it. I was not happy with how that turned out. One of the big problems was the um, the, the video RAM, well, RAM in general, requiring a negative voltage, which I didn't know much about at the time. So I thought maybe someday I could redeem myself with that project. And also I was thinking about this because I just took apart that master system, which is basically an evolved version of the ColecoVision. But just for this video, I want to talk about something even weirder. The expansion module number one for ColecoVision. What is it? Well, this allows you to play Atari 2600 games on the ColecoVision. How? That's a good question because the ColecoVision hardware is radically different from the Atari 2600. The ColecoVision has video RAM for one thing. <laughs> so yeah, let's take a look inside of this and see if we can figure out how they did it. It has its own joystick ports as well. Well, that makes sense considering the joystick ports on the, or the joysticks on the ColecoVision are, they are, <laughs> they use a very, 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 very convoluted uh, method of reading the data. Like really convoluted. Like hold my beer Sega convoluted. How much you want to bet this is basically good, just going to be an Atari that's putting video into the ColecoVision? Big reveal time. Oh, Coleco spun their own chip. Yeah, look at this. Sys 6507, that's the CPU from the Atari. Sys 6532, that's the RAM input output timer chip. And then this is clearly a version of the TIA that Coleco spun up from scratch. Um, of course they were sued for this. I believe Coleco won the lawsuit because I think they actually proved that they clean room reverse engineered the TIA, which means they didn't actually rip off the schematics. They just reverse engineered how it, how it worked. Kind of like how the first IBM clone BIOS worked. Um, so this connector, as you can see, ooh, that's a crusty critter. It's hardly using any of the connections, which makes sense because all you would really need is power and then you would send back the audio and the video and then probably some way, I'm guessing this probably holds the Z80 in reset. So I'm guessing you wouldn't, just guess. I don't have the power supply for the ColecoVision, unfortunately. I'm guessing you wouldn't even see the ColecoVision BIOS when you boot up if this thing is installed. Uh, let's check the pinout of this guy and see if they can answer some problems. I bet, well, depending on what kind of video this outputs. Pretty sure the ColecoVision, the uh, video chip that it used, does, um, uh, what's it called? Oh, it's slipping my mind. Component video out. Yes, it has component video out. Ah, everything's nicely labeled. 131, and that would be 60, I guess. Pins one and two are ground. Oh, there's a positive 12 volts, positive 5 volts, negative 5 volts. <clears throat> 60 is negative 5 volts. This connector also has external audio and external video, which I'm sure it's using. Uh, yep, those two are being used. I wonder why it's bringing over the negative 5 volts. What would you possibly need that for? Ah, oh, one of the pins, number 32 is external video enable that is hooked up to something. Yeah, so there must be something inside of the ColecoVision that allows you to bypass the video coming off of the main video chip. You know, it's kind of funny. Well, no, actually, that's not funny. <laughs> I was gonna say, the, the, the TMS-991, it can actually include an external video signal as it's color zero. However, you would need a gen lock in order to make it actually work, which I don't think this has. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 is reset. Look at all these crazy traces they did just to avoid having a two-layer board. Oh no, it's buried under the controller or the cartridge slot. Yeah, but it's it's using reset. 
Yeah, the ColecoVision would just sit there like a turd, and then this thing would run the show. And I guess it wouldn't matter if the Z80 is running. I hooked up 5 volts. Let's see if anything happens. No activity on the bus. I cheated. I googled, and there was something on Atari Age about this. So this module actually uses the clock of the ColecoVision to drive everything. So I did notice there were no crystals on this. So yeah, the ColecoVision CPU clock was 3.598, whatever, basically NTSC color burst frequency, which is also what you need to feed into the TIA of the Atari 2600. So you would need a separate um, oscillator going into this to give you the clock. But I still, why do you need positive 12 and negative 5 volts? That's what I don't understand. I'm feeling really lazy. I'm going to use the AFG from my oscilloscope to generate the frequency that I need. Just got this cable going to a BNC, going to a breadboard, and then I'll just wire some jumpers up. Yeah, on Atari age, they said, all you need is five volts and a clock. Terrible early 80s solder mask that doesn't mask worth a darn. Square waveform, waveform settings, frequency. Yeah, let's see. Let's make it a five volt signal. That should make it chooch. Just FYI, I've got uh, I've got channel one of the scope hooked up to the output of the AFG, so that's actually what we're reading. That's how we get the feedback. Question is, will it do anything? Five volts. Hook this up. Let's see if there's any bus activity. Some of the lines are high and some are low. I wonder if I need to reset it manually. Let's get a reading of the reset line. Uh, oh, reset line is low. That's probably why there's no activity. Reset of the CPU to that. Okay, that's definitely reset. Oh, where is this going to? Of course, it's under the cartridge slot and I'd have to pop rivets in order to get rid of it. Okay, I'm going to do a 10K resistor to VCC connected to reset and then a switch. So, in theory, it will keep it out of reset. You tap the switch and then it should reset everything and execute properly. Let's see if that made a difference. All right, still got my clock being pumped out as far as I know. Let's double check that. Yep. Bus activity, nothing. Reset. We have bus activity! Yeah, see, when a system starts, it's in an unknown state. That's why you actually have to hold it in reset for a little bit, then release it, and then you get active, valid data. So if you go back here, this pin here is supposed to be... should be video out. Do we get anything? Oh, that's odd. I'm not seeing anything. Is it using those high voltages to create the video signal? Why would it do such a thing? Oh yeah, sure enough, 12 volts is sneaking over here. So they're probably using it in their rip-off TIA chip. So what's the negative five do? Why would you need negative five? There's no, there's no dedicated static RAM on this thing. Actually, no, that wouldn't be static RAM, that'd be DRAM. Dynamic RAM. And by dynamic, they mean will fade. It's like they're trying to make it sound like it's cooler than it is. I'm gonna ask you, for the 300th time, are you a cop? I know the first 299 times you asked me if I was a cop, I said I wasn't, but I've got a confession. What is it? I'm a cop. We was family. Oh, are those more fake vias? What's the negative? Okay, I could see them using the positive 12 for something with their video chip, especially since they use the LM1889 uh, component video to uh, composite video converter chip, which was actually also used in the ZX Spectrum. But what in the bleeding heck is this negative five hooked up to? So you've got like this, this fake via here that didn't go anywhere. Then you've got something down there. Is that actually a via? Of course, it's covered up by this cartridge slot. I don't want to remove the cartridge slot. Uh, where does this beep out to? 
What would he use negative 5 for? Because everything, the 6502 and the 6532 are both 5 volt parts. I guess I could just hook up 12 volts and see if it works. Let's use this PC PSU. This thing has been used for everything. Look at all this. You <laughs> think micro USB and all these other weird ports on it. At first I was upset because you were a cop. Now I know you're something more important than a cop. What's that? Family. What? I'm what? Your family. I'm, I'm friendly? No, family. Let's try this. Got bus activity, but do we have video activity? Uh, something's going on. So oh, it's an improvement? Ah, I feel like I'm so close. Although I don't know why it's using negative five. All right, I've got this inverter chip from another project I'm working on, which you can see is still in breadboard form. It uses like an old school LCD. Anyway, this chip should allow me to easily invert the five volts. Okay, I hooked up the LTC 1144. Uh, it's pretty easy. You just uh, hook up a couple capacitors, you send in a voltage, and it gives you the inverse of the voltage. So I've got five volts coming in and uh, negative five volts coming out. Let's see if it uh, works. I suppose I should test it first before I actually hook it up to the circuit. That's weird. On what is supposed to be the video output, I'm still getting like, it's actually a very, very attenuated clock signal, like the 3.59, blah, 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 whatever. I wonder why that's, so adding the negative five didn't change anything or didn't help anything. I know it's working too, because if I go to this pin, which is external audio and I hit reset, I see the waveforms on the scope of the Frogger music. This corner of the board, these are the resistor ladders that are summing the video circuit. Like right here we have the blank, the horizontal blank. Then we have some of these attached to five volts, which is causing a pull up. So this here, that's five volts, which means it's pulling up the open collector signal from the video chip right here. And that's giving us luminance values. I guess the question is, um, where is it being summed at? Over here, this is the color burst. That's the DC color burst, and then here's the AC color burst, which is being combined. But at some point, all these signals are being attenuated someplace. I don't know why. Like, I can see they're discrete components, but for whatever reason, they're not coming out at the adapter card edge thing. Oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> Leaving these two resistors disconnected probably didn't help things. There's a NTSC signal here, but it's really floaty. It's like, I don't know why, it's on the high end of the voltage spectrum. Yeah, because the signal, the NTSC signal comes from over here. It goes into this resistor, which is pulled down to ground. Then it goes through this resistor. And then this is the output that goes to, what was it, pin 34? Yeah, no, pin 33. Yeah, the signal is just way too weak. I'm not picking anything up, even with my super camcorder. This is kind of strange. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut this trace, because I believe this is the luminance sum input right here. I'm going to cut this trace and see what kind of signal I get before it goes to this. I can always fix it. It's not a big deal. Okay, I cut the trace, and now I'm going to sample from just the luminance side. Let's take a look at it on the scope. And yeah, that's what you'd expect to see. You can see the um, H-Sync low pulses down to zero volts. And if you scroll to the left, those spikes, those are objects on screen, such as, oh, this is for the Frogger cartridge, so those are the logs. Frogger is such a great car test cartridge. Yeah, so the, the black and white signal looks fine. It's just something is, m after, after this point, it's getting messed up or attenuated by something else. I hooked this camera directly up to the uh, black and white signal. Let's see if we get anything. Uh, still not getting anything. Uh, the camera's impedance might have attenuated it. Is that Ben's big word today is attenuation? Yes. <sighs> yeah, I'm not exactly sure why I can't get the proper video signal off of this. Maybe it is damaged. If I had a full working ColecoVision with power supply, I guess I could test it, but I did not have all of those parts. Well, at least it was fun taking a look inside of this and we did get it to run. The code was running, we just uh, didn't. Oh, 
that was still connected to my oscilloscope while I desoldered it. Oops. <laughs> the function generator. <clears throat> yeah, well, I th what I think I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna put this back together in the in the you know in the shell, and then if I ever come across, I think Charlie Emery at Spooky Pinball has a functioning ColecoVision. Maybe I could maybe next time I'm down there I could bring this along and see if it actually works. Have an update video for for everyone. So when you bought this adapter to let you play Atari games on your ColecoVision, you were really just buying an Atari 2600 clone that used your ColecoVision as a power supply. Maybe that's where they got the idea for the Atom. Wow, this row of pins is really, really close to that metal. That's like, danger zone! Maybe I should put some electric tape down. Ah, that tape should insulate it really super well. No problem, no, what do they say, no wackas. This is really nice RF shielding though, it's really thick. Not sure what gauge it is. Probably like 24 gauge. It's a uh, pretty beefy. It's pretty beefosaurus rex. There you go. I said it. You bred beefosaurus rexes. Do 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 do. It's a beefosaur. Well, at least this thing doesn't need any retro bright. Hey, is there a port of Attack of the Petsky Robots for the ColecoVision yet? Oh wait, it's a Z80. Well, no, no, they're porting it to consoles that aren't Z80 based. Wasn't there like a Atari ST version, I think? They even made an Atari 800 version for crying out loud. Nobody cares about the Atari 800. One of the reasons I remembered I had this on my back porch, my house's back porch, not the video back porch, uh, was taking apart that master system because as I mentioned, the master system is kind of like an evolved version of the ColecoVision, even though they're from different companies. Um, so, whereas in this case, you know, they had to graft on basically an entirely separate system, the Atari 2600 to make it work with the ColecoVision. A ColecoVision and a Master System are actually in a lot of ways quite compatible. We did a episode about that on the Ben Heck show many years ago. I think it was called The Game Brain. And we got it to boot to BIOS in both the Master System and the ColecoVision. But it might be fun to revisit that sometime, especially now that I have extra um, Master System parts. I've got an extra ColecoVision. I've got a bunch of game gear. So maybe I'll revisit that in a future, a future video. But anyway, yeah, that was just a quick video looking inside of this weird expansion module. And I hope you continue to have a happy holiday week.